Words at War. Sign here, Corporal. Yes, sir. Now, I'll just add my signature. That'll make your discharge final. There we are. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Gosh, it feels good, eh? It's wonderful, Doc. <laughs> wonderful to be going home. Uh, you're telling me. I can't wait till I get there. My girl Christine and mother and dad and... Oh, boy. How long has it been? Two and one half years. And now, Doc, I'm as light as a nickel balloon, the way I feel. Like all the Christmas mornings and birthdays all rolled into one. Hey, <laughs> Corporal, uh, don't take this wrong, but two and a half years is a long, long time. I mean... When you do get home, keep remembering that a lot of things have happened to you. A lot of things have happened to that girl and your folks, too, you know? Well, I guess that's right, but what of it? Uh, maybe nothing, maybe something. Remember that. Now, so long, Corporal. All the luck in the world. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council of Books and Wartime, presents another in the widely discussed series, Words at War, dramatizations based on the most not notable books to come out of the war. Tonight's book is Soldier to Civilian by George K. Pratt, a distinguished psychiatrist, and our play, using Dr. Pratt's conclusions as a guide, will touch on some of the factors of readjustment which face the soldier on his return to civilian life. Now, will you please come to order? I want to thank all you folks for coming down to the council chamber tonight. This is a very informal kind of a session. Some of you are called personally. Some of you are here because you saw the notice in the paper. Anyway, you're welcome, all of you. Now, as your mayor, I thought it was none too soon for the people of Greenville to begin preparing for the day when the boys come home from the war. As representative citizens, you must have some ideas. Now, what should we do? What should we plan? Well, we've been talking about it. It seems to me, Mr. Mayor, that there's really nothing left for us to do. Oh, really? No, no, why do you say that, Mr. Edwards? Well, Washington has taken care of everything. There's the GI Bill of Rights, cash loans, unemployment compensation, free education, hospitalization. We've got nothing left to offer. Oh, I don't agree with you, Mr. Edwards. Well, and neither does my women's club. We think that the town should start right now to collect funds for a monument. A monument! Splendid! Let's have a permanent honor roll to show our gratitude. Uh, Mr. Mayor! Yes, sir? Uh, how about a parade? Oh, of course, a parade. The biggest parade Greenville ever had. And a bronze plaque. Uh, right at the entrance to City Hall, huh? Good, good, a uh, plaque. Uh... I don't know how the other merchants feel, but I'd count it an honor to give every returning serviceman five dollars worth of groceries. Now, that's, yeah. really that's, now right. that's real public spirit. I'll give a wristwatch for every silver star. I'll give a year's subscription to the Bugle. And to the first veteran to become a father, I'll donate a deluxe pre-war layette, complete with bath paper. <laughs> yeah, that's the spirit. Good suggestions, all of them. Now, I'll tell you what the city is going to do. We're going to give the boys preference in all our jobs. In a few years, the city will be run by veterans. Oh, oh now, wait a minute. Please, everybody, quiet. No, no. What? Who said that? I did. This is too much. Now, see here, young man. Now, Mr. Mayor, please, I've been listening to these suggestions. They're all bad. But that last one of yours is the worst of all. Now, if I could say a word... Now, this is a town's people's committee, son. You've no... But, Mr. Uh, Mayor... Now, please... Sit down. You can't interrupt. But I tell you, your committee is off the bee, Mr. Mayor. Forgive me, but it's cock -off. Well, now, really? Who are you, anyway? Russell Richards is the name. Corporal Richards. Corporal? Yes, Where's your uniform? I should say I'm ex-corporal Russell Richards. Oh, ex-corporal? You mean uh, you're a veteran yourself? Yes, sir, I'm a veteran now. And if you'll give me a chance, I'll be what I really want to be. Russell Richards, private citizen. All right, son. You've got a right to speak. Thank you, sir. I read about this meeting... I came because I figured I could help, and I was right. You people just don't know what you could do for the boys. Well, you just heard a list of what I thought were excellent suggestions. Now, just which ones do you object to? I object to all of them. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, just a minute, folks. Uh, go ahead, Richard. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm not very good at talking, but I've simply got to tell you what's on my mind. You see, 
Everything you want to do, well, it's wrong because it makes soldiers into a separate group. I don't get it. We only want to show you boys our gratitude. So you talk about giving us jobs just because we're veterans and putting our names up on monuments just because we've been in uniform. Well, I, Can't you I, I see? Don't... All that will just set us apart. It'll, it'll make us different from everybody else. But you are different. Well, of course we're different when we come home. But we don't want to stay different. We've all got to live together with our families and our jobs. We have to live with you. Now, don't forget this. You have to live with us. All right. What can we do about it? Yes, Richards. After all, the city can't interfere in your personal life. When we were made into soldiers, didn't that mean interfering with our personal lives? Oh, but that's different. We needed soldiers to win a war. Yes. Won't you need civilians to live the peace? Of course you will, ma'am. Citizens who belong, not a bunch of ex-soldiers. I know. What do you mean, you know? Well, uh, I got hurt a little at Salerno. And after a few months in hospitals, the army discharged me. Ever since then, until a little while ago, I was a soldier impersonating a civilian. Impersonating a civilian? Yes, sir. I wore no uniform and I drew no pay. But in my heart, in the way I thought, I was still a member of Company K. I could have saved a lot of time if the folks at home had been doing a little intelligent thinking. What about your family? They needed help, too, at least as much as I did. They tried hard, but they just couldn't understand me, the, the stranger who came home in the body of their son. Let me tell you my story. When I was in the Army, I was just like any other G.I. All we thought about was getting home. Home. <laughs> to me, home meant my mother and father. Great people, both of them. From my private foxhole at Salerno, they both seemed perfect. Home also meant Christine. We weren't engaged exactly, but... Well, Christine was the girl I dreamed about. Sure, I heard some talk about adjustment to civilian life when I was in the Army, but I figured, why would I have any trouble at home when I wanted to be there more than any other place in the world? You can imagine how wonderful I felt when the train pulled into Greenville. Russ! Russ! Dad, hello! Hello, Christine! Yes. Where's Mother? What? Can't hear you. Hello, Dad. Hello there, boy. Where's Mom? Is she coming? Russ, oh, Russ. Christine. Oh, <laughs> gee, you look good to me. And so does Main Street. Look, same old sugar bowl yonder and Schultz's grocery and the opera house. Oh, gosh, it's great. Glad to get home, eh, son? I'll say. I feel as if I've been away for a century. Oh, nonsense, Russ. It's only been 30 months. 30 months make a century these days. <laughs> well, we sort of like the idea of having you back, Russ. Now we can settle down and forget it all. How's your back? It's fine, Dad. Oh, that's wonderful. Sure, I forget about it most of the time. But where's Mom? Well, uh, <coughs> your mother decided not to come to the station. Is she sick? Oh, no, no, not at all. She's, uh, well, she's getting dinner so we can eat as soon as we get home. Oh, I hoped that she'd meet me, too. She's all right, isn't she? You're not keeping anything from me, are you? Oh, she's fine, Russ, only... Only what? Well, your mother was... Well, she thought she'd better not come. I don't get it. Hang it all, she was nervous about seeing you. Good grief, why? Well, well, you see, Russ, she was afraid you might be hurt more than you told us. Oh, I see. Don't let her know I told you. I'm sorry, Russ. Well, let's get going. Yeah, sure. What are we waiting for? Maybe I was wrong, but I had always imagined that when I came home, there would be father... Mother and Christine, all of them, waiting at the station for me. Somehow I had that picture in my mind, and somehow that, that first disappointment stuck with me. I tried to forget it, but I couldn't. It haunted me even when I was so happy talking with Christine. Even several days later when we sat down to a Sunday dinner that was everything I'd imagined. More chicken, Russell? Thanks, Mom. It's swell. <laughs> we had chicken in the Army, but it never tasted quite like this. <laughs> Christine? No, thanks, Mrs. Richards. Christine is watching her figure. Russ. Guess she's afraid I won't marry her. Go ahead, Christine. <laughs> It'll be a long time before Russ will be able to marry you anyway. Dad, what makes you say that? No use pretending you're ready for marriage when you aren't, Russ. Now, that's something for Chris and me to decide. After all, you were just a kid when you got into the Army, and that isn't so long ago. Don't worry about us, Mr. Richards. We'll get along. It's not that we don't approve of you, Christine. Of course you understand that. But Russ is going to need someone to take care of him. Mother, I can take care of myself. But thousands of people our age get married, Mrs. Richards. Well, that's different. Russ isn't just an average boy. 
He's been through so much. Don't beat it to death, Mother. Be careful how you speak to your mother, son. What do you mean? Russ, Russ, go on with what you were telling us before. Your father wants to hear it. You mind, Dad? I, I don't feel much like talking about it now. Oh, come on, Russ. Sure, we'd like to hear it. Ah, you boys did a fine job. Everyone knows what a fight we put up at Salerno and how tough things were. I, I've forgotten what it was. I remember, Russ. You were telling us about how you got back with the others after your company broke up with the German tank formation. Something went wrong with the radio. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, we were awfully tangled up there for a while. Every inch of the beach was covered. I don't know how they managed it. Nobody knew how things stood, and it all happened so fast. But uh, the shore engineers finally caught up with us, and... Then things began to make a little sense. You see, Were you it was scared, Russ? Too b busy to be scared. Yes, of course. Well, now, it seems to me that if the landing had been properly prepared for, there wouldn't have been so much trouble on the beaches. Now, I read a whole lot about it. But, Dad, uh, sometimes you've got to take risks besides... As I was saying, preparation, that's what was lacking. Now, if instead of sending the infantry in so soon, they had provided greater air cover, you would have found... That... The way I figured is that... If this knife were the line of transport ships standing off but shore... But that's not right, Dad, you see. Let's see now. Yes, yes, that's right. This knife is the transport, and the red plate is the harbor of the town. Chris, is there anything the matter with me? Why, Russ? I thought I'd smash something if Dad kept on talking another minute. Oh, you've had too much excitement today, that's all. Is it? I wonder. Of course, darling. But I do wish you wouldn't be so touchy. But why did he interrupt me? Why didn't he let me finish my story? Why did he keep on treating me as if I was a knee pad? Oh, forget it, Russ. Let's, let's just be ourselves again. Okay, darling, I'm sorry. It's like old times being together out <laughs> on this porch. I almost feel as if I was never away. You know, you look just like I remembered you. Only more lovely. Please, Russ, I'm not used to being flat. <laughs> you better get used to it, because I'm going to be with you every moment that I can from now on. Say when, and I'll be there. Tomorrow morning? Oh, but, Russ, I've got to work tomorrow. Well, forget about work. I can. Why not? I've got a desk full of priority applications. If I don't take care of them tomorrow, it, it just means delaying getting equipment the Army needs out of the factory. Besides, I'm in line for a Chris, promotion. Chris, stop talking like a civilian. Russ. Everybody is just trying to show how important he is. Darling, be reasonable. I'll see you tomorrow night. What am I supposed to do all day? Talk to myself? That wasn't the only thing we quarreled about. And it doesn't really matter what we quarreled about. Because half the time I didn't understand myself why I was so irritable. By the time I went to bed that night, I was a very lonely and confused ex-soldier. On the next day... Yeah? Russell, are you awake? What is it, Mother? Oh. Here, darling. I brought you your breakfast. Oh, no, Mom, you shouldn't bother. I'll be downstairs in a little while. Please, Mom, I... Russ, I now you know you shouldn't. Shouldn't what? Come downstairs. Well, why not? I'd rather eat with Dad and you and besides... Now, Russ, you mustn't excite yourself... What you need is a complete rest. Mother, please. Come now. Let me help you with your tray. Really, Mom, I'd be much more comfortable sitting at a table. You've simply got to take it easy. All right, Mom. Have it your way. You just go ahead. I'll tidy up and get busy arranging your clothes. Why should you? I'll do it. I know just where everything is. You're going to stay in bed today. I don't want to stay in bed. I'm not sick. Look, Mom, the doctor says my back is all right. He said I should do a lot of walking. I was cooped up in that hospital for months. Mom, what are you staring at? <laughs> My poor boy. You've been through so much. Stop it, Mom. <laughs> Stop it, will you? <laughs> Don't look at me like that. I can't stand it, Mom. Russ, I'm sorry to mention it, son, but I'm concerned about you. What? Just look at yourself. What about it? Your shoes need shining. Your tie's crooked. And don't you ever wear anything but sweaters? In the three weeks you've been home, you've done everything you could to look like a tramp. Can't I take it easy for a while in my own house? A boy can't afford to let down, Russ. I hope we see you spruced up before dinner. Oh, Russ, your father doesn't understand that you must have absolute rest. 
Here, dear. I've shined your shoes for you. I could have done it myself. Darling, let me help you put them on. Russell, you ought to go to work. For Pete's sake, Dad, I've only been back a couple of weeks. Please don't talk to me like that, boy. Will you get it through your head that I'm not a boy anymore? You're behaving like one. If you were mature, you'd know that routine would be good for you. Routine? I've had a belly full of routine. Hello? Is Russ there? Well, uh, he's home, but we're keeping him quiet. Anything wrong? No, only it's best for him to save his energy. Russ has to rest. Mother, give me that phone. But, Russ, you... Hello? It's Bill, Russ. Yeah, yeah, Bill. I'll be there next week. I'm sorry I missed the first class, but you can explain the charts when Russ, I see Russ, now, you. don't make any plans What did you to say, Bill? I, 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 I Russell, can't listen to me. You're not going to start anything until you feel perfectly all Mother, right. Mother, can't you please wait? I'll call you back later, Bill, from someplace there's a little privacy. The railroad station, maybe. <laughs> Well, son? Oh, hello, Dad. Hi, Mom. I was relying on you to be in at a reasonable hour. You have to get up early tomorrow. What's the idea? Russ, darling, you've got to take care of yourself. Mr. Langford is expecting you at the plant in the morning, Russ. I'm not going. You know about this course in radio over at the university. I've told you. Poppycock. That's a perfectly good job at the plant. I hate to say it, son, but all this talk is just an excuse. Look, get this straight, will you? I'm running my own life. I won't be pushed. I can't be pushed. I don't need you telling me what to do all day and every day. I'm sick of it. Russell. I can't stay in this house. I can't breathe in this house. I've got to get out of here. I can't take it any longer. Russ. I don't understand that boy. I simply can't understand him. I don't know what I did in the next hour. I must have wandered blindly. I wanted to be with Christine, but something was missing. She seemed to be thinking of things in some strange way that I, I couldn't understand. I started seeing more and more of the other ex-soldiers in Greenville. There wasn't much to bring us together except one thing we all understood. We had all been in the Army. One thing you have to say for the Army, at least you know where you stand. If you're a private, you're a private. If you're a sergeant, you're a sergeant. You know it. And everybody else knows it, too. That's what I like. You don't have to fight to be recognized seven days a week. You're part of something that makes sense. You have a job to do and it gets done. Yeah, these civilians, they disgust me. Take the government. They need workers for war plants. So they put on a campaign to beg guys to stay on the job. I try to get a job. Can I get one? No. Nobody will hire me. The Army's through with me. What do I do now? <laughs> for this, I sweated out two years in New Guinea. Assistant to the assistant to the vice president in charge of three-cent stamps. It's tough, all right. Yeah. Don't you know what I've been fighting for? So my overage brother-in-law can take over the store while I'm gone. Sure. And they can put us all out to pasture. Ten dollars a week for life. Russell Richards, was that Hank Davis I saw you with last night? What are you doing, Chris? Spying on me? I couldn't believe my eyes. You with Hank Davis. What's the matter with Hank? You used to tell me what an awful loafer he was. He never held a job more than a month in his now, life. Now, look here, Chris. You've got no business criticizing my friend. I just repeated what you used to say. Well, that was before Hank was in the Army. In the Army? How much good did Hank Davis ever do in the Army? Everybody in town knows that they let him out just as soon as they found out he was a brick, a gold bricker. Now, look, Chris. I don't want to hear you talk that way about Hank. You don't know anything about the Army or why they let him out. He's someone to talk to, which is Russ. more than... Russ. Russ, listen to me. What is it? Russ, do you still love me? You're all I thought about for two years. Do you still love me? Yeah. At least I think I do. You think you do? Oh, Russ, I can't understand you anymore. What's wrong? What's happened to you? A lot's happened to me. You don't seem to see that. I know, but that's over with. You're out of the army now. Yeah. And I thought I came out with some ideas that made sense. But you all seem to be just standing still here, talking into space. What you think about just isn't real. You don't hear what I say. You don't listen to what I want. Oh, Russ, how can you say that? How can you think we don't want to help you? Help me? That's what's wrong with all of you. Why should I want you to help me? I'm not going through life with your arm around my shoulder. I can do without it. Russell... Do you realize you're losing me? What? Think, Russ. You're losing me. 
I'm losing you. Are you kidding? I... I'm willing to forgive... Oh, you are. Well, don't do me any favors, Chris. Maybe some things I see a little more clearly than you do. It's just possible, you know. All right. If that's the way you want it. It's been nice knowing you, Russell. Goodbye. So long, Chris. Well, Mr. Mayor, that's my story. At least that would have been my story if Christine hadn't done what she did. Thanks a lot for meeting me, Russ. It's okay, Chris. I wouldn't have blamed you if you hadn't after last night. You see, Russ, I'm feeling a little humble. Yeah? I was pretty angry when I left you. I guess we both were. And then when I got home, I got to thinking about us, about you. We've always felt that we were meant for each other. There's certainly never been anyone else in my life. That goes for me, you know that. I loved you before you went into service. You were everything I wanted or needed. I knew the guy I loved must be somewhere. I'm the same guy who went away. Yeah, I see that now. But I didn't see it until it hit me last night. Hit me like a ton of bricks. You know what did it? What? When I realized how it sounded to you when I said you were losing me. <laughs> I'll admit it. That was a while. I was stupid. Stupid and selfish and blind. Chris. I was patronizing you, Russ. Thinking of you as a problem, almost as a dependent little boy. And suddenly it hit me. Maybe I need you more than you need me. Maybe you have new wisdoms. Maybe I'm the one who needs help. You weren't losing me. I was losing you. That's what really counts. I wouldn't go that far, Chris. I'll settle for this. We were losing each other. You may need me, but believe me, I need you too. Oh, Russ, darling. Chris. <laughs> Remember what you used to think of the Army when you were in it? <laughs> Everything was wrong. I can show you your letters. I remember. And everybody at home was perfect. <laughs> I remember that, too. But I'm not perfect, and I never was. I'm just human like everybody else, including your mother and father. You forgot that they were human, too. Take your father. He's used to being the center of attention, particularly since you went away. Hey, you remember how upset you were that Sunday at dinner? Do I? Don't you see it, Russ? He was just competing with you unconsciously because you had the attention of your mother and me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been plenty wrong myself, Chris. And harboring resentments and not speaking out and not taking the family into my confidence. I let it, let it fester inside of me when I should have got it off my chest. <laughs> sure, I shot my mouth off, but not in the right way. Oh, sure, because we've irritated you. But you've got a sense of humor. And you gotta be patient, too. I will be, Chris, I promise. You can begin finding your real place now. You won't have to pretend you're still in the Army. That's how you picked up with Hank Davis. You don't really like him, do you, Russ? I like you better. <laughs> <laughs> Come here. <laughs> So, Mr. Mayor, that's the story, except for the happy ending to come. Well, I'm really glad they finally You see, Mr. Mayor, you talk about personal lives and not interfering with them. But what is Greenville? What's our whole country? But a lot of people living personal lives. Maybe that sounds silly and obvious, but if you make eight or ten million men feel like a class apart with, with plaques and with monuments and five dollars worth of groceries, believe me, you're playing with trouble. I get your point, Mr. Richards. And I confess you leave me feeling a little helpless. Well, I'm confused, yes, frankly. Uh, I... What can we do as a community about our discharged soldier problem? Problem, did you say? Problem? <laughs> Label us as a problem and, brother, will be a problem. You people who stayed home can be a problem to us, too. Don't think you can, if we choose to look at it that way. But that's the wrong word, and we both know it. Why does anybody have to be a problem to anybody anyway? Well, young man, can't you be more specific? I mean, give us some general rules to follow. If you want a prescription, ma'am, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. You see, despite the uniform they wear, soldiers are all different. 
I guess sailors are too. I mean, they went into the service as separate individuals, and so they come out as separate individuals. Of course, some of us will have more trouble than others getting back into the civilian groove, but some of you will have more trouble than others getting used to having us around again, too. Well, then, what's the answer? Maybe the best answer is a good old American commodity called common sense. But we can't exactly ignore you. You found that out with your family. Yep. Well, thank goodness that's straightening itself out. But don't get me wrong, please. I don't mean that we veterans are turning up our noses at a little attention now and then, or even a little hero worship, if that's how you <laughs> folks feel. But believe me, the right job and a chance to make something of it is a lot more important to me than my name on a plaque. And, and having the folks I love take for granted that I can stand on my own two feet and letting me do it means more than being cheered while I'm marching a dozen parades. Yeah, I see what you mean now about not liking to be reminded that you're different. I exactly. guess we have to remember. Well, when you get right down to it, sir, are we so different? I'm not so sure. Maybe we're just about the same guys who went away. I'm sure most of us are. And we both ought to be glad we are because we've got to live together, all of us. It's just that, well, some of us have spent a few weeks or months or years living with fear and horror, that's all. It, it did something. It was bound to. Yes. You were there in the actual battle at Salerno while, while we've just gone on living on Main Street. No wonder our little thoughts and ways must seem small and narrow to you. No, I, I wasn't going to say that, but it's a little bit true, maybe, yeah. Except that don't forget, it was that same Main Street I wanted to get back to, so much I could taste it. But we do have some new ideas of what some things are worth in terms of other things. And we want to share those ideas with you more than anything in the world. Yes, you've had it tough, son. But you've got a new slant, too, and a new confidence. Unless we ruin it. And if you ruin it, of course, we're going to be impatient and jittery. We're hungry for your help, sir. Our help? Son, we need your help. We most yeah. certainly do. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mayor, and thanks to all of you. That's, that's just what I've been talking about. That's, that's just what I mean. Don't knock us around and don't mollycoddle us. Look at us and look at yourselves and we'll do the same. If our attitudes are right and yours are right, if we're living together and the air is clean and good, whatever we do for each other, now or ten years from now, is bound to be right, too. <laughs> Tonight on Words at War, you heard a dramatization suggested by a book by Dr. George K. Pratt, Soldier to Civilian. The script was by Baith Blau. Mason Adams was heard as Russell Richards and Francis Heflin as Christine. Others in the cast were Ethel Everett, Eleanor Audley, Joe Boland, Frank Butler, Ken Danew, Robert Harris, Tom Hoyer, and Ted Jewett. The music was arranged and played by William Meter. Direction, Garnet Garrison. <laughs> at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This is the National Broadcasting Company.